We exist to lead people to become radiant disciples of Jesus Christ. The gathering can be in your home. You can have discipleship in your home. We've had baptisms in people's bathtubs. Uh, we've had people give communion in their home. People in this church um, just don't stop. Like they find a way. Radiant City Vision is not an end, it's a beginning. Well, hey, Radiant Church, so good to see you guys. Everybody take your Bibles out if you have them. And if you don't have it, it's gonna come up on the screen. If you're at home, let me invite you, open your Bibles with us as well. And I want you to turn to two scriptures today. Number one, I want you to turn to Matthew 6 and Hebrews chapter 12 is the second scripture. This is uh, part four of our Be Radiant series, all part of our Radiant City vision, uh, focus, and strategy that we're all a part of. How many of you uh, were able to watch New Rain last weekend or this week? Raise your hand if you've watched it. Wasn't that inspiring? Man, some of the stories in there, just uh, Jane and I watched all the way from Florida, and uh, we got choked up because I I actually did not see it until it uh, aired. Uh, and I wanted to be surprised by it, but I was just so uh, so moved, so touched by it. And if you're not registered to watch this week, uh, make sure that you join us, uh, that you go and you can go to radiant.church slash new rain and you can register there. I know it was on uh, the update there, but we want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to see this. And as part of that whole building a Radiant City vision, We're looking at the five core values of really what makes Radiant Radiant. And last week, uh, Pastor Caleb brought an incredible message on being family-oriented, and uh, it was just so powerful. And today, we're going to be looking at what it means to be kingdom-focused. Radiant Church is a church that is kingdom-focused. Look here at Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 31. Jesus said these words. He said, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Now turn over uh, to Hebrews chapter 12, and look with me at verse 28. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 28 says, Therefore, let us be grateful that we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us therefore offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. In both of these passages, and there's a whole whole slew of scriptures in the New Testament where the emphasis and the focus is on this idea of the kingdom of God. This is the message Jesus went forth proclaiming. When he went from city to city, village to village, it said he went and he declared, the kingdom of God is in your midst. What does it mean when we use that idea of the kingdom of God? Well, the word kingdom comes from a Greek word, basileia, and here's what it means. It means the reign or the rule or the realm of a monarch, of a king. And so a king's boundaries of his, and his borders of his kingdom, that's called, so, and, you know, we, we would say like state borders. This is the kingdom of Michigan, although it's a democracy, uh, it's different than a monarchy, but we understand boundaries. Jesus went forth declaring the kingdom or the realm or the rightful rulership of God everywhere that he went. And here's what we know. Jesus is the king. How many know that Jesus is the ultimate king of kings and Lord of lords? So here's what that means. It means wherever the king is, that's where the kingdom is. And wherever the kingdom is, that's where you can find the king. And wherever Jesus went, he went proclaiming the kingdom of God. And how did he back that up? He preached it, and then he exercised his rightful rule and authority. He cast out demons, he healed the sick, he forgave the sinner, he gave hope to the hopeless, he multiplied the bread and the loaves. And what was he doing? Those were called signs and wonders. What was he attesting to? He was declaring he had a rightful rulership over 
even nature itself over the ability to forgive sins and the ability to cast out demons. Why was that significant? It's because in this present age, in this age between the time that Adam and Eve fell in the garden until the time that Jesus, the king, returns and fully establishes his kingdom on the earth, has been a period of time that has been under the sway of spiritual darkness, evil. It's been under the domain of the God of this world, Satan, the devil who hates God, hates you, wants to come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He's blinded the eyes of unbelievers. He's convinced people that there is no God, and if there is a God, you're free to do whatever you want to do. In fact, his greatest lie is to convince humans that you're God so that you will become a captive to your sins, so that you will become a captive to the powers uh, and the oppression of darkness. So what did Jesus come? He walked into villages. He walked into towns. He walked into situations where darkness was reigning and ruling. And he exercised kingdom authority by saying, I'm stronger than you, demonic spirit. I'm stronger than you, sickness and infirmity. I'm stronger than you, death itself. And he raised the dead, healed the sick, cast out demons, and he declared, I'm doing this to tell you that one greater than the devil, one brighter than darkness, and one more alive than even death, the grave, or even human life itself is in your midst. And I am the Messiah, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He ultimately proved it by going to the cross and and then defeating death itself by being raised from the dead. And because of that, Philippians chapter 2 says, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's my king. So when we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about more than just, you know, God's God and he's over it all, he's made it all, but he's kind of given us our world. Now, Jesus came to declare that in the midst of this broken, evil age, the kingdom of God has broken in and he is exerting his authority. And listen, the church is meant to be an extension of that kingdom. The kingdom of God begins in us. Everybody take your index finger, raise it up, turn it towards yourself, and point it and say, the kingdom of God is within me. You got to say it like you actually believe it too. So take your, let's try it one more time. Rewind the tape. Here we go. Take your index finger. Ready? Point it at you and say, the kingdom of God, kingdom of God is, within is within me. Now, if you are a Christian, then that statement is true. If you're not a Christian, you're not a follower of Jesus, you're just going through a dumb exercise in a building someplace. Because the reality is when we're born again, when we come under the lordship of Jesus Christ, what we're saying is, I believe Jesus is the son of God, that he died for my sins, that I should legally have paid for, that he rose from the grave, victorious over death, hell, and the grave, and I bow my knee to Jesus as Lord. I come under his kingship and his lordship, and at that moment, the kingdom of God invades my life. But here's what I've discovered, is that a lot of us think that salvation is more about fire insurance than it is about the kingdom of God. I want to pray a prayer to make sure that when I die, I don't go to hell. That's fire insurance. So I prayed the prayer, and I want to live my life the way I want to do, because he, if we have that mentality, here's what we're saying. I like Jesus as my savior. I just don't want him to be my king. I like Jesus as the one who forgives my sins, but I don't want to declare Jesus is Lord. Because saying Jesus is Lord means he's master, he's God, he's over it all, I'm not. Now this is really, really pronounced, especially in American Christianity. And let me tell you why. It's because America is the great democratic experiment. Now, democracy is a great way to govern human governmental affairs. It's the best way to do it. But it is not how God exercises his authority. God is not a president. Jesus is not a prime minister. Jesus is king. And what that means is this is not the republic of God. This is the kingdom of God. 
And here's why that's important. It's because you and I live in a democratic republic as a nation, but if we're Christians, our citizenship first is in a kingdom. And in our democracy, here's what we get to do. We get to vote on things. We vote on who we want to be our leader. We vote on legislation. We vote on laws. We vote on rules. And if we don't like it, then we change it. That's democracy. It's power to the people. But in a kingdom, that's not how it works. In a kingdom, there's a king who's on the throne, and it's his decree, it's his law, it's his power, it's his rulership, and we serve him. Now, I'm grateful that Jesus is a good king. He's the best king. He's a generous king. But he's not taking polls about which legislation we're all excited about. He's not finding out what's trending, and he's not running for election. Psalm chapter 2, God the Father prophetically declared hundreds of years in advance before it ever happened. He said, I have already set my Messiah, my king, on Mount Zion. And that's Jesus. Jesus is king, and yet we're used to having our say in things. Why is that a, a bad thing? It's because we, if we take our democratic principles and we apply them to biblical Christianity, we end up with a me-centered gospel instead of a Jesus-centered gospel. And we're called to be kingdom-focused people. We're called to bring our whole lives into focus around Jesus Christ and who he is. That means we're going to have to allow some other things to not become our focus. If you've ever taken pictures with a camera with a lens that's adjustable that you have to bring into focus, some of you who are really, you know, like the old, my, so family pictures in my house were a nightmare. In fact, I still have trauma and PTSD from them. And I, I had to go to therapy for some of our family pictures because my stepdad had one of those old cameras with the lenses on it. And so you had to stand there. He had to get the lights and he's like, hold still. And he's doing all the adjustments. It took like 10 hours and then all of a sudden he'd snap picture and he's like okay let's do it all over again it's like no dad I can't every Christmas it's like you had to open your gift like halfway through stop so that he could get an action picture of you opening your gift and then he had to bring it into focus it was terrible because if it was back before you had previews where you could actually see the picture, you were guessing what it was going to look like. You had to learn to bring it into focus. How many of you remember the days where you had those disposable cameras where you would like, you know, go on a vacation, take pictures of everything, right? And you didn't know what was on it. You had to take it to Myers or to Walgreens, drop it off, and then 24 hours later, go back. And then you paid $25 to get it done quick. And then you got it. And then you go through your pictures. And it's like, I can't see a single thing. They're all out of focus. <laughs> Anybody had that experience? So now you got all these negatives and you got all these pictures. And it's like, I think that's... I, that might be you in there. It's out of focus. Here's the problem. What if we get to the end of our lives and we look at the film of what we did with our life and we come to realize we were living our lives focused on the wrong things and the kingdom of God and the eternal things were out of focus. And so therefore, we weren't able to see them there wasn't any fruit in our lives. There wasn't any glory unto God. And it was because we were distracted and focused on all the wrong things. That in the moment, we think are really important. In the moment, we think it's about me. In the moment, we think it's about the things of this world that are temporal and subject to change. But in eternity, it's only the kingdom of God that is going to remain. That's what Hebrews is talking about. It's, it says in Hebrews chapter 12, Therefore, everything, God says, yet once more in heaven and earth, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. How many know that we've been experiencing a shaking of everything that we thought was stable, everything that we put our trust in? It has been shaken. But God says, I'm not doing it to destroy. I'm doing it to unveil. He says, I'm shaking everything that can be shaken so that that which cannot be shaken remains. What is that? It's the kingdom of God. So that when this whole thing is done, when human history is done, what is going to remain is the unshakable kingdom of God. And the Bible says that that actually is our inheritance. That kingdom. Because here's the good news. Not only is Jesus king, but he's made us royalty. 
And he's given us an inheritance called the kingdom of God. But in order to inherit it, we have to be focused on it. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, the reign of God, the way God does things, the rule of God, the power, the presence of God. Seek that. What does that mean? It means focus on it. Make it the primary focus. Make it the main thing. Point your lens at Jesus, at the kingdom of God and God's way of doing things and what he is doing in the earth. From an eternal perspective, make that your focus. On your screen, tap that so that everything else around it might be blurry, but that is going to be crystal clear and obvious in your life. And then he says, and all these other things will be added unto you. You see, God's, God's a God that if we'll put him first and we'll focus our life on him, he's a good provider to take care of everything else. But the world, the way of the world is put our focus on everything else. Put our focus on our job. Put our focus on our fitness. Put our focus on politics. Put our focus on money. Put our focus on, you know, we're a selfie generation on our social media. It's like, oh, here's me. I'm, I'm making another piece of avocado toast. And, and here's, it's like, we, we have to put our focus on Jesus, on the kingdom of God. So, how do we do that? How, how do we bring our life into focus around Jesus? Here are some declarations, I believe, that will help us bring our life into focus. And I'm making, I put these in the form of declarations because I want us to be able to say these and to state these over our lives. Number one is this. Declaration number one is Jesus is my king and I live for his approval alone. Come on, I want somebody to say this with me. Say it with me. Say, Jesus is my king, and I live for his approval alone. Doesn't that just feel good to say? My spirit jumps on the inside of me when I say that. Because it's life. Think about these statements. Acts chapter 17, the early church, in the formative years and months where the church is beginning to move out in power and strength. Here's what the world says about the church. In Acts 17, verse 7, it says, These men who have turned the world upside down have now come here also. And Jason has received them. Jason was one of the leaders of the synagogue. Jason has received them. And look at this. It says, And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. The church was accused of worshiping Jesus, not just as Savior, not just as a religious icon, not just as an avatar. They, they were going forth and saying, no, there is another kingdom that we are aligned with, and there is a king, and his name is Jesus. You do not know how revolutionary that statement was. You say Jesus is king in America, and it's like, oh, yeah, that's really nice. I mean, you know, Kanye came out with an album by that title. It's Jesus is king. I'll compose. I mean, you got this whole thing where Jesus is king, and everybody's fine with that. You said Jesus Jesus is king in Rome, and you got your head cut off. Because in Rome, under the emperor, whether it was Nero, whether it was Vespasian, whether it was Titus, whether it was Domitian, whether it was Caligula, any of the Roman emperors, if you declared yourself to be another king or to be a servant of another king, it was punishable by death. And this is what Christians were going around declaring the kingdom of God is here, just like Jesus did, just like the apostles did. And they said, no, there's another king and his name is Jesus. They tried to censor. They tried to censor the, the early church. The Jewish leaders tried to censor them. Rome tried to censor them. We would say they had cancel culture. But they were trying to tell them, you can't preach in that name anymore. But they did it, boldly. They said, no, you can't proclaim another king, but they did. You know, we're living in a day and age, cancel culture, where it's like, if you don't say the right thing, then we're gonna cancel you on social media. I'll tell you what, I'd rather be canceled in history than canceled in eternity. I do not like it here or there. I do not like it anywhere. <laughs> Let the hearer understand. John 18, Jesus answered Pilate when he asked him, 
Are you a king? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. The definition of Jesus being your king is that you listen to his voice. That when Jesus speaks, you hear him. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. Here's a question. Whose approval are you living for? Whose approval matters most? Because I'm going to tell you what, in this world, you are either going to live your life for God's approval and God's approval alone, or you are going to live your life seeking the approval of culture, seeking the approval of influencers, seeking the approval of educators, seeking the approval of anybody who has what you want. Whose approval are you listening to? Whose truth are you willing to die for? Because this is what it comes down to. Jesus said, if you hear my truth, then you understand why I've come into the world. I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Paul understood this in Galatians 1.10. This is a scripture that I've been thinking and chewing on and meditating on for about two years. It's Galatians 1.10. He says, for am I now seeking the approval of man? Think about that. Or of God? Or am I trying to please man? For if I were still trying to please man, I could not, would not be a servant of Christ. Do you understand what Paul's saying is you can't serve people and Christ. You can't do it. In this culture, what they're trying to train us to do is to self-censor. Put a filter on you. They're trying to break people's mentalities, especially people of faith, they're trying to break our spirit like you break a horse. You walk it around until it gives up and then it finally takes the bit and the bridle and it will do whatever you tell it to do. But it started off as a wild stallion who went where it wanted to go, ran, it would not submit until the spirit gets broken and then it will do whatever you tell it to do. That's what the spirit of this age is trying to do to the church. It's trying to get Christians to self-cancel. Come on, dial down your commitment to Jesus. Dial down heaven and hell. Don't use language about repentance. Don't overquote the Bible. Just use a little bit more self-help. Make it more generic. Keep it to yourself. Pray quietly in the corner. And you were created to be domesticated. The Holy Spirit on the inside of you was not created to be, was not put on the inside of you to, for you to be domesticated. You are wild at heart. You are full of the power of heaven. And you cannot back down or bow the knee. We live for the approval of one. And on that that day, let me tell you something. And that day, we'll bow the knee to Jesus. I will throw my crown down, and he can have it all, but nobody gets my crown. Let no man take your crown. Because Jesus is king, and I live for the approval of him alone. Number two, declaration. My citizenship is in heaven, and I'm an ambassador here. Everybody say that with me. Say, my citizenship is in heaven. I'm an ambassador here. One of my favorite albums, I grew up in the 80s, listened to a lot of Christian contemporary music, CCM music, and one of my favorite bands was Petra. Anybody remember that yeah. old band? They had an album called Not of This World. We are strangers. We are aliens. We are not of this world. And I remember even as a teenager, 13, 14, 15 years old, when that album came out, just the, the revelation and the reality of that statement, that I'm not from this world. It's not just a cute little metaphor. It's reality. My citizenship is in heaven. And just thinking and meditating on that, that yes, I live on this planet, but I'm here on mission. This is not my home until Jesus returns and makes it my home. But right now, I am actually an ambassador for Christ, a missionary, if you will, 
An ambassador is a representative of the head of the state of another kingdom. And the Bible says you, as a born-again child of God, are an ambassador from the kingdom of heaven who's been sent to the earth to enforce and to legislate kingdom of God legislation. Think about that. That's what Jesus meant when he said, when you pray, pray, your kingdom come and your your will. Whose will? God's will. King Jesus' will. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Paul's writing to believers at Philippi, and he says, your citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is interesting that Paul uses this language in Philippians, because Philippians was a letter that Paul wrote to the church at a town called Philippi in Asia Minor. Philippi was one of the wealthiest cities in all of Asia Minor, and the reason for that is it was named after Philip, who was the father of Alexander the Great. How many have ever heard of Alexander the Great? He conquered most of the known world, established the Macedonian Greek Empire. His father's name was Philip, and Philip was an incredible military general. They named the city after him. When Rome became the most powerful empire, they kept it in place because of the great debt to culture, language, and military education that they learned from the Greeks. So they honored it by making this city Philippi a city of high status. So all retired military leaders, all retired politicians and members of Senate had their retirement by moving to Philippi where they were given tax-free status. They were elevated to a very high, wealthy place of honor in the city. In fact, this was called the crown jewel of the Roman Empire. And so Paul's writing to believers who are living in this city that has great wealth, has great status, it has great luxuries, it has everything that you could possibly want. And because if you were a citizen of Philippi, it was like, you had it made. And Paul writes to Christians there and he says, I want to remind you, your citizenship is not in Philippi. It's in heaven. Your citizenship is in heaven. You have a higher citizenship. If Paul were writing to the American church today, he would say to us, your citizenship primarily is in the kingdom of God. Yes, you live in America, you're a citizen there, but your eternal citizenship is in heaven. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, Paul writes, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He says, you're an ambassador. You can't be an ambassador for a nation unless you are from that nation. Your citizenship is in heaven. God sent you to planet Earth to be an ambassador of his kingdom that represents Jesus everywhere that you go. Think about that. What a privilege it is for us. And what's the message that he sent us with? It's called the gospel. The gospel is the good news that God, who is the rightful king and the rightful judge, instead of pouring out his wrath, has actually poured out his mercy, and he's sent us to compel fallen, rebellious humanity be reconciled to God. Please, he sent us to you. We were previously foreigners and strangers, aliens. We were previously enemies of God, but he loved us, adopted us, brought us in and gave us citizenship. And now we're telling you, you need to get right with God because there is coming a day when King Jesus is gonna crack the Eastern sky. He's gonna step out of eternity back into history on a white steed, his eyes blazing with fire. And he's not coming back as Jesus meek and mild. He's coming back as King Jesus, blazing eyes and wild. He's coming back and he's going to make his enemies his footstool. He's going to set up his throne in Jerusalem and he's going to reign and rule for a thousand years and his saints are going to reign and rule with him because we are already citizens of the kingdom that is as well as the kingdom that is coming. Come on, somebody put your hands together. That's our citizenship. First Peter chapter two says, you, everybody say you. you. I mean you, say you. That means me. Say me. Thank you. (laughs) You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people, and you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of visitation. Did you notice that? It says, so that when they see your good deeds and speak of you as evildoers. If you're really gonna live like a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, it's going to stand out as so oddly different from the behavior of the world that they're actually going to call your good behavior evil. But in the process, they're going to see the difference of your life, and they're actually going to glorify God because of the way you live your life. That's why Paul says, live differently. Abstain. Abstain from things that are fleshly and carnal, that destroy and wage war against your soul. Don't live like the world. Remember where you're from. Remember you're an exile. Remember you're a sojourner. Remember you're an ambassador. Why? Because your kingdom, your homeland is not here. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. I love this statement. It says you are a chosen race. Listen, in the body of Christ, there is neither male nor female. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither circumcised, uncircumcised. There is not black. There is not white. In Jesus, we are all one. There is one race. It is the new race in Christ Jesus, the new humanity. If we want to see race and, and the issues of race that right now are destroying our culture, that people are battling over, it's not going to be, this problem is not going to be solved by the best fallen humanity human minds coming together and building a better toolbox. This is going to be solved by all of us coming to the foot of the cross, receiving grace and forgiveness and looking each other in the eye, loving one another the way Jesus is loving us, recognizing the beauty in the diversity, and instead of fighting for our rights, laying down our rights, taking up our cross, and letting the world see unity in the name of Jesus. And it needs to start in the church. We need to get over ourselves. Um, all right. <laughs> Number three, declaration. The gospel is my pledge and my power. I'm a kingdom-focused man. We're a kingdom-focused church. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is my pledge and my power. Paul writes in Romans 1, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. You know what the gospel is? Mankind is sinners. We've sinned. We've rebelled against God. And if God were just a fair God, God would have just poof and given us what we deserve. But I'm grateful that we don't serve a God who's fair. We serve a God who's merciful. It always cracks me up when people say, well, it's just not fair that bad things happen. I'm like, do you really want God to be fair? Do you really want God to give you what you deserve? No, you don't. Pop quiz, here's the answer. No, you don't. <laughs> no, what we want is we want mercy from God. And the gospel says, you are a sinner. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We rebelled against a good God who made everything perfect. We were deceived, fell into sin. God could have left it at that, and he would have been perfectly just. He doesn't need anything from us. He's eternally self-sufficient. In triunity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he's worshiped by angels. But yet God, in his mercy, took on flesh, came in the form of a man, 
died on the cross for the sins of the world. The one who knew no sin took on sin so that you and I, who all we knew was sin, could be made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. He was raised from the dead. You can't earn it. He offers it as a free gift to whoever will believe on it. And when you believe on it, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You will live forever and eternally as one of his children, co-heirs with Christ, reigning and rule over all the cosmos and the universe. Someday you will judge angels and you get it all for free. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He's washed it white as snow. That's the power of God unto salvation. And I'm not ashamed of that gospel because it doesn't mean God is an equal opportunity savior. You want into the kingdom of God? It's absolutely free. But it'll cost you everything. Because you can't take your old life through the narrow gate. Jesus says, repent and believe. What does repent mean? It means I have to lay down all other allegiances. I have to lay down all privileges. I have to lay down all preferences. I have to lay down all pleasure. I have to lay down all identities. I lay it all down and I die to myself. And in that moment, by his spirit, he resurrects me. And I'm born again by the spirit of God, a child of God. Heaven lives on the inside of me. And I'm wonderfully saved. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is my pledge. And it is the power of God unto salvation. This is what we're called to preach. Here, around the corner, and around the world. Jesus sent us out for one purpose, to preach the gospel to the whole world. And when we say Radiant is a kingdom-focused church, we say, look, we are focused on living our lives in submission to his lordship, his kingship. And we're saying, Lord, we will give our lives for your approval, whether anybody else ever approves of us or not. And we will preach the gospel boldly, courageously, strongly, clearly, without compromise and without watering it down because it is the only hope that we have. It's the only hope, church. It's the only hope we have. It's the only hope for the world. And as imperfect as we all are, the gospel is perfect. The word of God is perfect. Jesus is perfect. And he's calling all of us to put our lives into focus around him. Would you stand with me even at home? Would you just stand with me? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. There are a lot of things that we could easily put our focus on. There are a lot of things individually we could put our focus on. But in the end, they're only mirages. In the end, the only thing that matters is that Jesus is king. His kingdom has come, and his kingdom is coming. It's here in part, but Jesus is coming back. And when he comes, his kingdom will fully come. Do you know him today? Do you know Jesus as king? I'm not talking about, do you know Jesus as the cartoon figure. I'm not talking about, do you know Jesus, the religious icon? I'm not talking about, have you ever said a prayer? I'm talking about, have you submitted your life to the lordship, kingship of Jesus and all of the implications of that? Elliot, who was a missionary to Ecuador some 50 years ago, ended up as a martyr, made a statement. He said, he is no fool who would lose everything 
he can't keep in order to gain what he could never lose. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This life is like sand that we hold in our hands and the tighter we squeeze it, the more of it slips through the cracks of our finger till there's nothing left. But if we put our hands to the plow of the kingdom, if we offer our lives to the one who gave his life for us, none shall be lost. Jesus said, those that you've given me, Father, none of them have been lost. I want you to bow your heads with me right now, if you would. I believe in this room, the Holy Spirit is moving up and down rows, up and down aisles, and there are are individuals, you know in your heart of hearts, you have lived as a renegade against King Jesus. You've lived for yourself. Jesus has been a good little add-on accessory to your already good life, but you've never really bowed the knee and said, Jesus, your way is my way. Maybe you're here today and you know you're lost in your sins and you're an enemy of God. You can't earn your way out of it. Today, he offers you forgiveness. Today, he offers you grace. If you'll repent, if you'll surrender today, God will forgive you. If you're a prodigal today, you're listening to me and you know that there was a time when you were serving Jesus and you were living for the gospel, but you've modified the way that you've lived your life in order to accommodate your way. Today, he's calling you to repent and come home and give your whole heart, your whole life to him. Today, in the sound of my voice, if you know you're not right with God and today you want peace with God, forgiveness, come under the kingship and the lordship of Jesus. You're saying, God, save me, forgive me. I repent. I'm no longer going to live for myself. I give you my whole life. Today, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be my Lord. Forgive me. I want to come into the kingdom of God. I want to come in to your kingdom. The only way is through Jesus. I'm going to say a prayer in a moment. But if you today are repenting of your sin and saying, Jesus, forgive me, I want to get right with you. I want to be forgiven. I want to be born again. I want to be a child of God. Pray for me. If that's you, wherever you're at, just raise your hand right now. He'll save you to the uttermost. Thank you. He'll save you. Yes, yes. I'm scanning the room. Raise it high. Today, best offer you're ever going to get in your life. Thank you. God bless you. If you've not raised your hand, raise it now. Say, Jesus, you're Lord. And I'm submitting to you. I've never done it before, but today I'm doing it. Even online, if that's you, God sees it. Just raise your hand. You can put your hands down. Thank you. I want everyone to pray this prayer with me out loud. This is our declaration of faith. Say, Heavenly Father, I come in Jesus' name. And I confess I am a sinner. I deserve judgment. I can't forgive myself. I'm dead in my sins, but I believe in Jesus. Jesus, you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Today, come into my life. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Today, bring me into your kingdom. I submit to you. From this day forward, I'm not going to look at my way. I'm not going to follow the world's way. Jesus, I say you are the way. And I will follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for loving me, saving me, and giving me new life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, can we just celebrate that?